from the movie capital of the world, Movie Talk, with Jonathan Crane and co-host Shelley Smith. This week's Movie Talk audience has just screened a new motion picture, You Can't Hurry Love, and will meet with its movie makers, actress Sally Kellerman, leading man David Packer, co-producer Simon Lewis, Director, writer, Richard Martini. And Movie Talk's nationally known critic, Stephen Farber. Are you ready to talk Movie Talk? I know I am. Ladies and gentlemen, your host, Jonathan Crane. Thank you very much. Welcome to Movie Talk. Tonight we'll be discussing You Can't Hurry Love, a new motion picture being released by Lightning Pictures, a division of Vestron. The picture is about a young man who moves from Ohio to Los Angeles to find love and happiness, ends up going to a dating service, winds up in different crazy situations. With us tonight are Simon Lewis, the co-producer of the motion picture, Sally Kellerman, one of the stars of the picture, David Packer, the leading man, and Richard Martini, the writer-director. Richard, we're going to show a film clip immediately, so why don't you set this clip up for the audience? This is a clip of Eddie, Eddie Hayes, David plays Eddie Hayes in the movie, mm -hmm. and uh, what's happening is, is he's gone to a video dating service. He's having a little difficult time in Los Angeles meeting women, and he goes to this dating service um, with the idea that maybe if I can make a tape of myself, they'll like me. Well, uh, he decides to make a different tape each time he goes in. Speak up. Tell him your name, age, special interests. I like to dance. I like to go to the movies, and as a matter of fact, I'm a director. Hey, baby, how's it going? Ed's the name, rock and roll's the game. Hello. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Edward Hayes III. Look, I just have one thing I want to say to you women out there. Whatever happened to old-fashioned romance? I mean, it used to be that two people could meet. <laughs> Maybe they'd fall in love. But now that can't happen, because nobody knows who they are anymore. So what is it? Is it me? I don't know. Hey, wake up out there. I'm talking to you. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome back to Movie Talk, where we're discussing You Can't Hurry Love, a new motion picture soon to be released. Are you happy with what you did? Are you happy with the result? Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm really happy because, um, you know why? Because, you, you know, there's a lot of responsibility in, in trying to create something. There's responsibility to the other actors because you're, these are the people who really put their souls on the line for you. And there's a responsibility to the production crew to like know what you're doing. And, to, and there's a big responsibility to the audience. And so ultimately, if you go in and you hear people laugh, then you really feel that you've sort of, you know, done your responsible thing. Did everyone here get along on the set? Were there problems? There's all, directors come in all sizes, shapes, and, uh, you know, personalities, and Richard, has an easy, I'm sure, uh, you know, David could say more, more than I could, but such a, you have such an infectious, easy, uh, warm, relaxed kind of uh, quality and a lot of yeah. fun to be around, Richard. And the first screening at the Director's Guild when, when they first showed this film, which is always a very nervous time for, <clears throat> for the director and producer, and everybody's worried, oh my God, they're not even going to like it and everything. And there was Richard Martini, the director, the last one to sit down in his chair, and I was just watching him. He was like leaning over, joking with his friends and stuff. He's like, oh, excuse me, Richard, but they're about to screen your movie for the first time in front of an audience. Will they like it or not? And you could see in his face, like no high stakes, that he was, you know, that he hoped you liked it. And if not, he'll make another one and stuff like that. But it's just, it's an unusual thing because, you know. Did well, everyone have a fulfilling experience? Simon? Is that for me? Yes, for absolutely. Yeah. Uh, it's very tricky when you're putting together a film from the production point of view because you have 50 or 60 crew people. In this film, 50 or 60 actors. And I would say everybody got on really well. It was a, a very good team. But how do you guys feel? Well, my brief uh, stay, I had a lovely time. Mm. Well, for me, it was great because Scott, the guy Scott McGinnis, who played Skip, my cousin, is like my best friend. And we were at dinner one night, and he said, man, I'm doing this movie, I think. And he said, there's the part of the other guy, you know? And uh, he said, it'd be fun if we worked together. And I said, okay. And then, so that was great, because we hung out all the time. So know. did you know Richard when he came in to read that he was best friends with Scott? I had no idea. The agent insisted that, uh, that we see David, and it wasn't until after 
he had read and really turned us on that I found it out. Of course, you know, it was like a few people in our minds, but that really cemented it for me because what a great thing to have in reality a relationship between two people and then to transfer that to film, you can only get reality out of that. I know that you did something else, which was to cast David Leisure, who plays Joe Azuzu in this picture, and we have a film clip of that. So let's go to the clip where David Packer goes to get a job, and David Leisure gives him one, reluctantly. My wife calls him on the phone. I hold my calls for 15 seconds. So, uh, <clears throat> what's this about a job? Hi, I'm Ed Hayes. My roommate Skip Dooley called you about me? Do Dooley? Oh, yeah, the kid who uh, house sits for the head of our London office. That's right. Got a resume? Um, I don't see any previous experience here. Yeah, well, I had a, a cable access show called Proud to be a Buckeye. I have lots of tapes. I could send you a sample. Look, kid, I hate to pop your weasel, but we only hire heavyweight people with credits in this town. You might as well apply back in uh, Akron. Very good. Let's have some questions directed at some of these people. What, what, what do you out in the audience wonder about, about this movie you just saw? This lady here looks like, you look a little skeptical. Do you want to talk about what you felt about the film? I like the film, so I'm not going to be skeptical. <laughs> but I, I do have a question about um, Mr. Martini mm -hmm. uh, being a writer before this and now a, a first time director. What sorts of things did you learn on the directing side, uh, good or bad? Well, I think uh, the first thing you learn is uh, the word is not sacrosanct, sacrosanct when it's your own words. You know, they say the script is the Bible, but in my case, you know, maybe the Bible's not that good. You know, I mean, so when you go to the set with your script and you go, wait a second, this isn't that funny. Uh, and, and what's great, though, is to bring in actors who can improvise. I'd like to say, Sally, it was real n great to hear you sing. Are you going to pursue this? Is this something that you're oh, planning on doing more in the thank future? Thank you. Actually, I, I've been uh, recording since I was about 18, and I've sold maybe four albums. You know, I invite <laughs> anyone who bought an album, I invite them home to dinner, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I was in Australia last summer, and so I'm like, oh, you know, come home. Uh, but I, uh, I have been in the studio again recently, and, uh, and love it, and, and do travel sometimes with a band, do some live shows, but right now I'm hoping to make a new album, and by all means, and thanks, I enjoy it. Stephen Farber has written film critiques for such prestigious publications as the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, and New West Magazine. Just before our show, he reviewed You Can't Hurry Love, and this is what he had to say. For years, people have sought salvation in La La Land. And You Can't Hurry Love tells one more story of a young bumpkin from Ohio who journeys to Los Angeles looking for exciting career opportunities and the girl of his dreams. The trite plot is enlivened by some appealing performances by a trio of gifted young actors, David Packer, Bridget Fonda, and Scott McGinnis. And there are some nifty supporting turns by a gallery of pros, especially a hilarious cameo by Charles Grodin. The writer-director, Richard Martini, keeps it all moving. He almost makes up in sheer energy what he lacks in novelty. But if f familiarity doesn't breed contempt, it does elicit yawns after a while. There's something awfully dated about this movie's mockery of California craziness. We've seen these dim-witted hustlers and cheerful space cadets in a number of movies directed by Paul Mazursky and Robert Altman and Woody Allen in the 70s. Still, if you're going to steal, those aren't the worst comedies to cannibalize. Considering how stale the story is, You Can't Hurry Love goes down easily. It gets three Movie Talk stars from me. Welcome back to Movie Talk, where we're talking about the motion picture, You Can't Hurry Love. We've just seen a review by Stephen Farber. Welcome. Thank you for being here. I am going to ask the director of this motion picture what he thinks about this review specifically. Is this a trite and stale story, Richard? Well, let me just say that if I wanted to make a trite and stale story, I'd be out of my mind. Um, my initial reaction <laughs> is this. I mean, I've been accused of a number of things here, being trite being stale, 
and stealing from other filmmakers. Give us something, you know, your, your thought processes on well, this. Well, you know, the thing is, is when you're talking about, A, video dating. Now, here's a movie about video dating. I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think there's any been made yet. Yes, there was. All right, well, uh, I'm not sure. Could you name it? Yeah, Robert Altman did a movie called A Perfect Couple, which maybe wasn't a well-known movie, but was very similar to this. It was about a video dating service and two people who go out with a lot of weird, wacky L.A. people and eventually oh, hook up with each other. Well, I think filmmakers or creative people in general have, you know, a lot of times will have the same ideas about something, but I didn't see the movie, so I, I couldn't have stolen it from them. But I think that the important thing is, is uh, you try to find out where are the the creative juices, where do they come from? And you quote, you mentioned Mazursky and you mentioned Woody Allen. It's easy to mention those people because they're successful people. I've never seen a videotape of parents uh, sending their kid a letter saying, come home. There's many things that I think we've done, we've broken ground here, but I, I, I don't see you appreciating that. You know what right. I'm saying? I mean, it's easy to say that it's stale, but. It's, uh, see, I think when you say, what did, um, where did they get their ideas, these other directors, I think the difference is that they were drawing on things that were contemporary at the time that really hadn't been dealt with and uh, they were making fun of certain of, uh, trendy things going on in Southern California and really kind of catching things when they were current and I think what I miss from this film is that sense of really contemporary satire. It's not that it isn't still valid, it is, there's still a lot of phonies going on, people trying to find a genuine way of life amidst all that craziness but there was not enough in this movie that really captured the particular idiocies and kookiness and you mean just how absurdities you would have done it. of this what, moment right now. You mean right how now. you would may have done the picture? Not really, no. I'm talking about looking at it as a contemporary film. It seemed to me that it dealt with a lot of things that I've seen in movies of the last 10 years. And they're funny. It's not that they're unamusing. But there, there was nothing in this movie that really made me think this is a movie that is on the cutting edge of what's happening right now in 1987. You know, well, we in Los Angeles can easily fall into the cliché thing of, well, that's been done before. You know, so, I mean, for example, if, if you go into a studio and you say, well, I want to do a movie about something, they think to themselves, well, that was done in 1957, it was a Myrna Loy, you know, and suddenly the creative thing that you had, the spark, is dead. And in this case, you know, I've got to express, you know, what I think is funny. I've also got to be able to, uh, you know, even if it's been done before, even, you know, I've, I know it's going to be my point of view and it's going to be different. Okay, let's take a look at another clip from the picture You Can't Hurry Love. Did you see the look on their faces when you sold them on coupons for the blind? <laughs> <laughs> what a concept. Concepts, Newcomb, are everything. If you don't have a concept, you don't have a product. Hi. Who are you? Hey. What are you doing here? I live here. Ms. Bones, Ed Hayes, I work for you. You do? Yeah, as a matter of fact, I'm in charge of alternate media. Newcomb tell you about that? No, he didn't. You little rascal. What's this all about? Uh, he's in, uh, uh handbills and flyers. All right, Shelley. I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to get the audience involved in this now. This is your opportunity to discuss with a critic your points of view of the film. So let's, let's have some questions. There's a, there's a lady right here. Stand up. Please. Yes. Uh, Mr. Farber, I'm not sure if you and Mr. Martini are friends or acquaintance, acquaintances, but it brought to mind how do you balance your friendship with filmmakers and then re re review their work? Well, it's difficult if you, I mean, I don't. Um, we hadn't met actually before tonight, and uh, as a critic, I don't have a lot of friends of people working in films. <laughs> but I do have a few. I have uh, occasionally maybe written a positive review that somebody has liked and may have met the director and become friendly, and then it becomes difficult to go on if you're going to review their subsequent movies. The best thing is to keep a certain amount of distance, not get overly involved with friend, in friendships with people uh, whose work you're going to review. If you heard this review, sir, would you think you would go to see this film? I would probably not go see it. Well, so do you that's... think that review was then not too fair? Or? I thought the review was, uh... boy, you put me on a hell of a spot here. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, that's what, what we do here. We're very good at this. <laughs> uh, 
I thought the review was uh, uh, a fair. I thought it was a little unfair uh, in uh, a couple of the areas. No, I enjoyed the film and I would go see it. I would recommend it, although I did think that the critic made several very good points. Sir. Yeah, I have a question for Sally. Sally, you've been in a Robert Altman movie or two. Do you see any similarity between this film and, and those films? Knowing Richard, and since you mentioned Robert Altman, personally they have such different points of view, even if the subject matter you know, is similar or, or not as fresh or something, it's, it's Richard's sense of humor. It's the thing that, I mean, I, I think even sitting here tonight, I realize more specifically how you can take the same subject matter and, and have such a different point of view. And, and Richard's is a silly, I mean, there's something warm. I mean, you know, I don't know. I like his people and I, and, uh, uh, you had a question, sir. Yeah, I wanted to ask the co-producer a question. Is one of the reasons you want names such as Sally Kellerman in a picture is so that you can become more critic proof because you will have Sally Kellerman fans come to see the picture no matter what the critic says? Um, it, it helps, but the key thing from my perspective, uh, workings I do within a management company structure is that's fine as long as it doesn't interfere with the director's vision. Um, in other words, a film such as this, where we have 60 actors all assembled, was put together very carefully, not just to be critic-proof, but so that it would be creatively satisfying to Richard, so that the people who are in the roles are all matched to their roles. It's interesting, that's one of the things that the critic enjoyed. We, we didn't make a, a studio movie where people were slotted in to roles for, for that purpose. I have a question I've always wanted to ask a critic. What makes a critic a critic? Why is your opinion supposed to be taken so much more highly than an audience appeal or of something of that nature? A criticism is very subjective and it isn't necessarily true that one person's opinion is better than anybody else's because we all respond out of our own personal experience. We bring things to it. We see it in a particular way because of our life experiences. I think the only thing that maybe is different is that the critic by nature of his position is able to articulate his opinions and the reasons for them, but he's able to form the opinion and express it in a way that maybe is more meaningful than just somebody who says, I liked it or I didn't like it. But is an implication of your question that you think critics have too much power? Is that what you're yeah. perhaps implying? What I'd like to say is that I think power is something that is um, given to a person by the audience. In other words, uh, he says what he thinks, and that's his job, because somebody's got to do it. And you then have the choice to how much power you're going to give them. If I could say one thing about that, though, that um, critics, people s assume they have a lot of power, but the main reason that people go to see movies is not because of what a critic says, but because of the advertising blitz that's put out by the studio behind the movie. That's what really persuades also, people. The word of mouth does indeed have great effect on the performance of a motion picture, which is kind of nice, because that is what indeed uh, popularity is all about. Stephen, I want to ask you, how can you justify the validity of a middle-aged male passing judgment on a picture that is obviously oriented toward the teenage, the uh, college, high school market? Well, my youth, my high school <laughs> years, my college years are not that far away from me that I can't remember certain things about it. I don't feel like uh, I should disqualify myself because I'm not, of the same, I'm not the same age as the characters. That's a very limited view of what criticism can be. I mean, this is the first time a filmmaker's ever been able to do this, so I feel responsible to, like, <laughs> somehow leap in there. And I just wanted to say, I wanted to ask you, ultimately, did you find it entertaining? Yes. I did find it entertaining, and uh, frankly, I would say that of, the, of its type, it's a better than average film. It just is not as memorable for me as it might have been if there had been some more incisive touches. <laughs> Next picture. <laughs> Great. For you, I'll have a couple incisive things. <laughs> a critic gave You Can't Hurry Love a three star rating. Our audience gave it three stars as well. It's your turn to go out and see the movie and judge it for yourself. I'd like to thank my guests, Simon Lewis, Sally Kellerman, David Packer, Richard Martini, and Stephen Farber. And I would also like to thank the audience. You've been an excellent audience. And Shelley Smith. And thanks to you, who are the ultimate critic. The truth is that you really are the real movie makers and the movie breakers. Good night, everybody. Mm -hmm.